Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 152 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. As you know by now, it is the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn all about knives and knife collecting, hear from the designers, the makers, the manufacturers, the reviewers, anyone who loves knives. That's what we are all about here on the Knife Junkie Podcast. And Bob, someone that uh, you've been uh, talking about, at least to me, for a while now that you yep. want to have on the podcast. So uh, who's, who's our guest today? Uh, tonight, uh, today I'm speaking with co-owner of uh, Spartan Blades and co-founder uh, Curtis Iovito. He started uh, Spartan Blades with his Special Forces colleague, Mark Carey, in 2008. And since then, they've been making these really amazing high-performance knives uh, fit for professionals in the field, but also you know, much desired by knife collectors and knife junkies such as myself. So uh, I've been carrying around the Spartan Harzi folder uh, for you know, months, it, it has right. become probably my favorite knife, uh, um, you know, bar a couple and, uh, I can't wait to talk to him. So. Okay. All right. Well, I was, I was thinking you were saying, well, I had to carry it today for research. I mean, that would, oh, be, a well, great yes. that would be a great excuse to, <laughs> to have to carry that awesome knife. I, I happen to have it close by too, strangely. It's right. Like. All right. Well, before we get going, I do want to remind you that uh, our podcast today is uh, brought to you in part by the Get Upside app. It's a great way to get cash back on your gas purchases. The Get Upside uh, app that you put on your smartphone whenever you need to get gas. You simply search your area, find Find a discount, claim that discount, fill up your tank, and uh, then when you're done, just take a picture with your smartphone of that receipt, and just like that, snap, you've earned cash back. So get the app at thenifejunkie.com slash save on gas. That's all one word, save on gas, thenifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Ever start looking for your next knife purchase before your last purchase has even arrived? Then you're probably a knife junkie. Curtis Iovito, sir, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. No, I finally made it. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks, guys, for having me. Oh, oh, it's my pleasure. So uh, I've had uh, my eye on Spartan Blades ever since uh, I spotted the Aries. And uh, oh, my God, I loved that knife when it first came out. Still love it. Um, but you've made so many other knives since then that I have also fallen for. Um I, you know, uh, Spartan Blades, at least to my audience, needs very little introduction. But tell me how, uh, tell me how you started this company. Well, sure. You know, uh, the inception of it started years before. I uh, wanted a knife for myself. Uh, I was a young E5. I was in first Special Forces group out at Fort Lewis, Washington, and uh, we had this old Sergeant Major used to come by named John Larson, and uh, you may know him from. Uh, in the knife community. He, he wrote for a few magazines, was the editors and that type of thing. But he would bring knives from companies like Spyderco and Benchmade, drop them off at First Special Forces Group, and he's, he'd ask us to torture, test them. <laughs> and we did. And I was like, wow, man, there's, there's a lot more knives out there than I realized. You know, so uh, I started working at a gun shop at Fort Lewis. Uh, you know, I was a weapons sergeant at the time, and I wanted to learn a little more about guns. But of course, when you're around mills and machines, you know, you start looking for new things to do. And I said, I'm going to make myself a knife. And I did, and uh, it sucked, man. It was horrible. <laughs> I mean, uh, the panel Wait. heights were uneven. It was big, bulky. It was nasty. So I threw it in the trash, made another one. And guess what? That one sucked too. After about three or four tries, I finally had one that I liked. Then, of course, I put it on my gear, and that's where it started. Guys were like, hey, can you make me one? So I made one for my buddy Jason, and I made a few more. And that was kind of the exception. You know, that's kind of where I realized, man, I'm, I kind of like doing this. Um, Describe that first knife that was worthy of carrying. Oh, man, it was 440C, sandblasted finish. I had a canvas micardal handle on it, but, uh, man, the handle wasn't all that contoured. I just found it out in my shed the other day. I was, I'm, I was moving to a new place, and I was like, oh, my God, people wanted these and paid for them. But uh, it was pretty big and bulky and uneven. But, you know, it cut. It was heat treated. It cut stuff. And, uh, you know, in the Army, if you – You'd think everybody in the army is a knife freak and they know all about knives and 
I never in my life considered that I would have to look at a folding knife and make sure the blade is perfectly centered. Right. You know, it opens and cuts. There you go, you know. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one of my first missions I did in Special Forces, I went to Indonesia. And I'm an Indonesian speaker, so I was happy to go there. But I met a, a, a guy who's considered a national treasure in Indonesia. His name's Teddy Carding. And I got to visit a knife shop where he manufactured all his own knives for the uh, Kapasukan Husus or the, the Indonesian Special Forces. Mm. And that's when it kind of it, it, it kind of stuck in my head, man, I, you know, I could probably do this as a business. You know, he's a uh, man. They were holding knives down with their bare feet and grinding them with hand grinders. Oh, but wow. he would finish them on the only knife grinder in the whole building. And they were beautiful. And I've got I've got some of those knives. Uh, but that's when I realized, hey, you know, this might be something I can do for a living. But, uh, you know, the Army got in the way of that. They sent me overseas uh, to Japan and then uh, back here to Fort Bragg. But uh, my good sniper partner, Mark Carey, and I, you know, we knew we wanted to do something. We wanted to start a business. We worked for somebody else. We didn't get the bonuses we were promised. And we said, hey, you know, I, you, I can trust you. You can trust me. I trust you with my life. We can at least make knives together. And that's kind of how it started. So, yeah. Uh, go ahead. So well, what was the knife world? What was the knife um, market like at the time that you thought you had the audacity to think, yes, let's start uh, a uh, uh, not only a knife company, but a knife company that specializes in these sort of, you know, really refined military style uh, knives. What was well, it like then? Well, you know, there wasn't as many knife companies out there. I can tell you that, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's the big one, Spider Co. This is 2008, um, right? Yeah. Oh, 2008. Okay. So a Strider was, was real big at the time. But you know what? We knew knives was something that got issued to us and that we used for cutting things. I mean, we had no idea there was even a knife community when we started. Mm -hmm. We just had a love for knives. And we looked at other things. We've been snipers all our adult lives. So you know, we looked at the sniper rifle industry real hard. We thought maybe we'd develop our own sniper rifle. And there's people in the industry that were willing to help us because they knew us from working at the sniper school. But we looked at that industry. We looked at how competitive it was, how much marketing cost. And, you know, it's it's almost a knife fight to the bottom in the gun industry. It's, mm. it's, uh, it's not like, uh, you know, I'll hang out with Ann Reeve, Greg Medford, and Rick Hinderer and have dinner with them. We'll have a good time and we'll go home. Yeah, we're competitors, but we all are part of a knife family. Firearms industry isn't like that. Mm. So, uh, you know, we decided uh, we'd start a business. Mark had a two-story pre-Civil War mule barn on his property. Uh, the bottom of it had spiders and snakes in it, which... I hate both of those things. <laughs> uh, we got a power washer, cleared it out. I threw my KMG grinder in there. Mm. And uh, we bought two computers and two desks. And uh, we didn't even have a name for the company. We built 30 knives. We sold them to buddies. And uh, we were sending a knife to a friend of ours out in Washington State at Fort Lewis. And we didn't even know how to ship a knife. So we put it in a box. We wrapped it with Army 100-mile-an-hour tape. Mm. We took it up to the local post office to our postmaster to ask her, you know, what's the best way for us to ship knives? And she just kind of looked at us like we're an idiot. She says, well, you put it in a box and put someone's address on it and pay for postage. <laughs> so uh, we, were, we were driving to, I'll never forget it, we were driving to the post office. I said, man, what a Spartan way of doing things. And Mark said, that's it. Spartan knives. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't ring. And he said, Spartan oh, blades. Yeah. <laughs> Spartan blades. Now that sounds better. And uh, so that was the inception of Spartan blades yeah. there. Uh, came back from the post office, sat down with a pen, drew a logo, and uh Made a few T-shirts and then it was, you know, one from there. Well, it's it's perfect for, um, you know, the type of people who who are uh, pulled towards your kind of knives, especially Spartan. You know, it's it's that spirit, the warrior spirit. Also, the um, trimmed down to the essentials. You know, nothing, nothing, uh, nothing extra. Uh, you don't want anything extra when you need it for, uh, you know, for the important kind of work that. Uh, these kind of knives are intended for. So you're in the game for 12 years at this point. Right. Um, how, so in the beginning, it was to all your military buddies. You made those first 30 knives in that mule barn. Yeah. Um, and like yeah. I said, we didn't even know there was a knife community out there. Right. Which was kind of neat because we got started and we started getting emails from people and we looked at some forums we're like, wow, there's, there's a lot of knife lovers out there. I had no idea. I mean, I knew there's people who collected knives and, you know, I've been a gun and knife shows. Mm -hmm. But we just had no extent of the depth of the knife community. But that community is what drove us to make better and better knives over time. Because, uh, you know, if the knife's not right, they'll tell you. Oh, yeah, so. for sure. For sure. And so you guys won some awards right away, like right out of the gate. 
you yeah. started, uh, you got some recognition. Uh, how, what do you credit that to? Um, you know, uh, listening to others, you know, when we started out, like I said, we didn't understand there's a knife community. We knew what a knife was because we were in special forces, sharp, yeah, pointy yeah. handle. Right. But we had to reach out to somebody who could, you know, lead us down the right path. So uh, the only knife makers we knew were Ernie Emerson because our unit had bought us some uh, custom CQC sixes, which when they got dull, we threw them away. <laughs> if I know what they're going to be worth now, we would have kept them, right? Oh, well. <laughs> exactly. And then there was uh, Chris Reeve, the guy who made the Abro knife. So oh, yeah. Chris Reeve was the name we knew. They were associated with Special Forces. So we called him, said, hey, we're Mark and Curtis. We want to start a knife company. And he just, there was silence for a little bit. And he goes, you guys are crazy. He goes, come to Blade Show and visit me. It's down in Atlanta. And then if you fly out to Idaho, I'll help you. So, so uh, he he said you're crazy. Now, how did you take that? Why do you think he said you're crazy? Uh, I, I, I imagine he knew we had no idea how much work it would take and how hard it would be. You know, um, yeah, it's it's a lot harder than a lot of people think. Um, but he knew that, and uh, he also said, "Come on out here to Idaho and I'll help you." Figure we wouldn't come because I'm sure he gets calls like that every day. So right, we right. said, "Okay, well we're coming." So we flew out there. We asked him for his address. We knocked on his door early in the morning. And Anne Reeve answered the door and she's like, can I help you? I was like, uh, I guess your husband didn't tell you we we're coming to stay at your house. <laughs> so she let us in and made us breakfast and, and she'll tell this story. She goes, I just, I didn't know who these two crazy guys were and I'm cooking breakfast and they're to my back. And she was, I think she was worried we were going to jump her or something. <laughs> but, you know, we, uh, we reached out to them, uh, and helped Mark with a lot of the business side of it. Uh, mm. I spent two days with Chris going through the shop and it's not like they taught us how to make knives, but what they did is they told us how to avoid the pitfalls of starting a knife company. They told mm -hmm. us how to structure our company, um, how to deal with dealers. Uh, they told us who some of the good guys and bad guys are in the industry as far as, as far as demanding dealers. So they sent us on the right path, but it was enough for us not to fail, in the, in, especially in that first year. Geez, that's some really valuable information. I mean, because in a way, yeah. you can learn the mechanics of making a knife from a lot of different people. But there, that's right. You know, to learn uh, about the knife business from that kind of company, the kind of company uh, that you and Mark aimed to be. Uh, and let me ask you: I, I'm now I'm making presumptions, but what did you and Mark uh, aim Spartan Blades to be when you started it? And 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 is this what you're doing now? It is. You know, we uh, we wanted. You know, we follow orders all our life and we always lived a very structured life in the military. We always worked on small teams. You know, we'd work in Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, Korea. And usually it was like seven to eight guys. And we kind of lost that structure when we got out. And we, we missed that camaraderie and, and team spirit. And it was our one chance, you know, uh, it was our one chance to, to have our own command and yeah. be in charge and control our own destiny. Um, and I was able to do it with a guy I trusted. So, uh, you know, quite honestly, I don't know what we pictured it as. You know, we were retired once. We had a full career. So we thought, you know, if it floated somewhere between hobby and business, we'd be okay. But we quickly realized by using things like military leader, you know, the planning process in the military and, uh, you know, looking at different courses of action, picking a hybrid, understanding your operational environment, um, working together as a team. It all kind of works in business. We're quite surprised, honestly. So, uh you know, we, I guess our plan was to do better next month than we did this month and to continually grow and get better at what we're doing. Um, so, so you spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia. Uh, you, you say Malaysia, you mentioned the Philippines, um, a lot of Thailand blade cultures, definitely oh. uh, heavily bladed cultures. Oh, what, what kind of, um, well, what did you learn from being kind of uh, uh, immersed in those cultures and how did it come out in the design of your work? Well, you, you know, uh, I watched how they made them. It was, it, I tell you, it's so impressive. When you watch a guy with a few logs, um, a hammer, forge a knife out, heat treat it, clean it up with a belt sander and it turned it into something that somebody's buying down the street, uh, you know, maybe realize, hey, if this guy can do it, I can probably do it with the help of some CNCs. Um, some good quality you know, machine work. It, and, and what it did is it put in my head that, hey, it was possible to do this. Okay. Uh, as far as the designs go, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to say, you know, that uh, somebody inspired me. Uh, quite honestly, I just sat down with white pieces of paper and a pencil, draw what I thought looked good. Um, 
and then we made them. So, so okay, all right. Uh, that was a leading question because sure. what what I what I was getting at is that uh, when I first saw the Aries, and what was the other knife of that era that had a, a fatter belly but a similar angle? The, the Nix. We did Aries, the, Nix, and Erebus, which was a Tanto blade. Okay. Okay. So it was the, the, uh, the Nyx and the Aries were the, were the two that just really, uh, you know, really caught my eye. And one of the things that caught my eye was the angle of the hand, the blade to the handle. And to me, that looked uh, Southeast Asian. That looked like that sort of almost approaching pistol grip thing that you see on a lot of Filipino blades. Well, the, the, the thought was, you know, cause after shooting a lot and playing with pistol grips and those type of things, um, you know, somebody told me, it went, oh, I'll tell you, it was Bill Harzi. He said the knife has to be sharp, pointy, and have a good handle. So I wanted to make a fighting knife. And I knew because we'd been in the Army, people expect something like that. The war was picking up. Uh, you know, I was talking to more and more guys that were getting into knife fights at breach points. So I wanted something that could be used as a lightweight fighter, but not so heavy that people wouldn't carry it. Mm -hmm. So when you thrust forward with the knife, your, your, your wrist is kind of angled at an angle. So in order to have that blade parallel to the ground so that it would, it would stab easier, it, it just kind of ergonomically made sense, I guess. Um, yeah. yeah, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I get it. And it also accelerates the slash and the chop and and everything else. I, uh, I, 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 a lot of how I judge a knife, I, it, I have to admit, is on the aesthetics. I love how that sort of thing looks, but also in, in just the history, I have a real interest in the history of Southeast Asian weapons, Filipino especially, and I love that sort of pistol grip setup, that sort of... Uh, oh yeah, we, we used to work with the uh, <laughs> the 69th Commando Unit, oh. and uh, uh, they were the, the A Squadron of the National Police in Malaysia. We used to train those guys a lot, and some of those guys with grommets could do things and mm. make the hair stand up in the back of your neck. I mean, they were incredibly dangerous with them. Um, so we had a squadron, which were the guys who grew up in Kuala Lumpur, usually of Chinese descent, um, well-to-do guys. Then we had B squadron, guys that literally grew up in the jungle and fought the insurgency. So our job was to try to blend these two guys together. So you'd see them arguing over the best knife fighting techniques. You know, you have a guy with a long, a long uh, knife that he used in the jungle, and then you'd have these kind of street cops carrying these crombits. And man, it's Whoa. very talented guys. So, so yeah, you know, uh, you may hear a lot that you know, people don't use knives in combat anymore. It's just not true. We live right here at Fort Bragg. We've got some a lot of special operations guys here. Um, a lot of guys use knives in combat, but it's almost always at a breach point. It's al almost always a surprise. So, okay. so we're learning how these knives, these fights develop, and uh, so we're changing our designs a little bit because um, there's a lot of pounding action in combat these days with knives, as opposed to parrying and thrusting and taking out sentries. So we're uh, is, is so that is that right. is that due to the prevalence of body armor and and other kind of uh well it, it, it's because they're doing raids or they were doing a lot of raids i mean mm -hmm. sometimes there's units that were doing three raids a night for months Jeez. so they're, they're, you know the bad guys don't stay in bed and wait to get killed you know they're mm -hmm. standing by they're waiting so a lot of times these guys are getting the grappling matches on the floor Jeez. and uh you know i don't want to go too deep into tactics but sometimes a knife's required right you can't right. use a gun so more and more guys are using edged weapons. Um, but, you know, I, I tell you, that's something else we learned. And, and we make knives for those guys, and they're here, and they come in off Fort Bragg and buy them. But 99.5% of people that use this knife are going to cut string, tape, open a box with it. So it's got to be able to do those things, too. So we learn over time what people, you know, what tasks they're going to do and what they need a knife for, and we try to tailor it to that, you know. So. Well, okay. So recently, uh, Spartan Blades uh, made what I find to be a, a, a great and interesting uh, move in partnering up with K Bar Knives and uh, and and creating Pineland Cutlery and making some uh, making a line of three so far. I think Spartan very obviously Spartan Blades. They have your your design language. For sure, but they're but they're made uh, in the K Bar facility using the right. materials they often use, the 1095 Crovan and uh, and their process. And they have obviously their K Bar, they're a huge manufacturing uh, facility, so they have more of an ability to turn out uh, a, a knife that you can charge a little bit that's a little bit more affordable than some of your other knives. Sure. And I I think that that is a great 
thing that you've done there because first of all, you make these knives uh, primarily for the men and women who are going to use them or rely on them in combat and such. Uh, but to make them more affordable, oh yeah, look at that. So that's the, what is that? That's the Alala? It's Alala. So yeah, you know, that it was an interesting thing that happened. We developed a really close relationship with John Stitt, the president of the K-Bar, um, simply because we liked each other. And uh, we were helping them out with a the project. Uh, they helped us out with a few things, turned into phone conversations. And, uh, you know, we went down there to help them uh, with some tooling. We said, hey, let, let's do a project together just for fun. So we made 400 egg daggers because they owned the egg company mm -hmm. and that went really well. So, uh, you know, their, their parent company is Cutco. They're the largest manufacturer of cutlery uh, in North America. So, it, you know, they were, hey, listen, we, we need to buy some. <laughs> we need, so uh, I jokingly told him a few months earlier before we came up there on our trip, to, I told John Stead, hey, if you're ever interested in buying a small little knife company in North Carolina, give me a call. It was a joke. All right. About two months later, I got a call and he goes, hey, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like too bad of an idea to us. Why don't you give it some thought? So, uh, you know, even Mark and I, we've only been at this 12 years, but, uh, you know, he did 22 pretty hard years in the Army. We weren't getting any younger. Um, so we started looking at our options. You know, do we hand the, the company off to kids? Do we uh, shut it down, close it up and, and fully retire at some point? Or do we, do we want the company to live in perpetuity when we're gone? Um, and I think the thought of, of, of developing something and making something that can last the test of time, you know, to me, it has a lot of appeal. So when I went to Olean to visit K-Bar and I saw the way they treated their employees, it was more like a, a family atmosphere, even, even downtown. You go to a restaurant with the stits and, oh, my, my grandpa worked for you. My dad worked with you guys. And I remember I worked there as an intern as a kid. You see, so I knew they were family oriented and I knew they had a strong military connection. So uh, doing something with them really appealed to us. It made a lot of sense. Um, so it does make a lot of sense. sense. And you're also, also making a, uh, uh, I'm not sure why I'm echoing there. There we go. You're also making a, a more affordable product, but you're keeping it in America. It's being made here. It's not like uh, you have to ship it off elsewhere uh, to have these things made that, that, that your target audience can definitely afford. You know? Well, you know, and the thing is, how do you capture, how do you spread the widest net? I mean, I know sergeant majors, colonels, um, general officers, they'll never spend over $90 on a pocket knife. They won the lottery tomorrow, they wouldn't spend over yeah. $90. <laughs> yeah. and, and quite honestly, that, that's the biggest part of the knife buying population in America. So, uh, you know, people know us, American made, American steel, American labor, and we pounded it, pounded it, and pounded it for years. And uh, it, it was a hard road, <laughs> I'll tell you. Um, so you, we had to open our eyes a little bit after teaming up with K-Bar and look at, you know, who's our customer? Who do you want to be our customer in the future? Mm. Um, so we're going to do three different lines of knives. Um, you know, we were worried about our reputation, quite honestly. And, and it was a worry we didn't need to worry about. But uh, we're going to continue to make the knives we've always made and develop new knives, high-end knives right here in our shop in North Carolina. You know, a lot of people think we have a large factory and, you know, a few hundred people. We, we're a six man company. It's amazing. Yeah, we're, we're six men um, and we do a little bit of contract work for coding and heat treating and that type of thing, but we have systems in place. So, so we're pretty efficient. So we're gonna continue to make the knives we, we've always made. We're gonna call that our elite or gold class. Mm -hmm. Then we'll have our silver line knives, which is the, the knives that we're doing with K-Bar. And we will do some stuff in uh, friendly nations, uh, overseas stuff. And that'll be our bronze line. Um, we're going to do those for people who simply can't afford a $500 folding knife, which is a lot of people out there. Yeah. You know, we, we get a lot of young E3s, E4s coming here with their wife and two kids. They know the names of our knives. They know what they're made of. They mm -hmm. know how large we design, the majority of them. But they can't afford them. And I just, you know, I hate that. Yeah. So we're going to let our customers have options. If you want it made by me, Mark and, and AJ and Jake right here in the shop, you got it. Um, if you need something more affordable and your dad was a grandfather was a Marine and you trust gay bar, you got those as well. And then for people who just want to throw one in a glove box and beat the crap out of it or leave it in a tackle box to rust, yeah. we'll offer something like that as well. But it'll be a good quality knife for what you're going to pay for. It. Of course. I mean, if you're going to put your name on it, it's going to have to live up to that. We, but, you, but even so, like a, a bronze class folder might be uh, the better choice if you're in law enforcement or in the military because, A, you don't want it stolen from one of your buds, <laughs> and uh, you might not want to thrash on a $500 knife, even though this knife 
could take anything. I love this. Uh, this is the, the Spartan Harzy for everyone who's uh, uh, watching, doesn't know what this is. You've been under a rock. The Spartan Harzy folder uh, designed by one of my absolute favorite knife designers, Bill Harzy. And uh, I, I had, um, I had really, really wanted this knife for a long time. I finally got it, and it has hardly left my pocket in the months I've had it. Well, I'm happy to hear that. You know, it, it, people love that knife, and uh, it just continues to grow in popularity. It, but if there's one complaint we get about it at all, it's mm -hmm. the size. Some people think it's a little too big. So I'm probably going to get in trouble for doing this, but I guess I'm going to debut this to you guys right now. All right. <laughs> so we're working on a smaller Harzi knife. We're going to call it the SHF 325. So it's going to have a, a 3.25 inch blade on it. A lot of people have been asking for that size for a long time. Uh, we've got rid of some of the hardware. So there's only two sets of titanium screws, titanium standoffs. And then uh, we did away with the lock bar stabilizer. So we've got a, a symmetrical pivot, which means the same on both sides. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't know if you can see that, but. Oh, uh, oh, oh that pivot, pivot works as the uh, over travel. You got it. You got oh, it. That's rad. So we're going to debut this probably next week. We're going to throw it online next week. Uh, we just did 30 of them. Nine of them are prototypes. But I put the pocket clips on. It says prototype underneath the pocket clip. So I'm just throwing them all together. Some people will get lucky. So that I'm is, not taking my part again. So, those are, uh, so Curtis, like, those are going to fly off the shelf like mad. I mean, we talk about this all the time. Three, uh, three and a quarter inch seems to be most people's magic yeah. length. Not mine, but... Uh, I would love to have that to complement this one. So yeah, I guess you're you're the first ones to see it. So there it is. That's a ah, thank you for showing it right here. That's so cool. I, I love the uh, the over not the oversized, but I love the large pivot as the over travel on the other side. That's a that's a cool touch. And, um, and quite honestly, I'm not sure. You know, maybe next year or the year after, we won't do something like that with this part with the SHF as well. Okay. Uh -huh. So so uh, Bill Harsey, uh, how did you score him? I mean, he's he is such an amazing guy, amazing designer, and and I swear I can pick every knife he's ever made out of a lineup. Beautiful. You know, I, well, I, let me we'll start in the beginning how we met Bill. Uh, you know, I, I told you we reached out to Chris Reeve, Chris and Ann Reeve, and uh, they helped us out. And when we went to Blade Show, we saw this big burly guy sitting at their booth, and it was Bill Harzi. <laughs> so, uh, you know, folks are busy at those shows. So Anne and Chris are running around like chickens with their heads cut off. So I got to sit down and talk to Bill for a little while. I, I took out the first three knives we had done. And I showed it to him. And he goes, I think he's got some potential. Um, <laughs> and they're the first knives we made. They, they were crude. They had machine marks through them. I seen a guy who has one of our original knives and said, wow, you paid for that, huh? Uh, but, <laughs> but, you know, quite honestly, at some point, you got to make knives, learn, and then improve over time. Sure. So I love seeing the older knives with the grind lines in them and sharpened a little uneven and because it brings back neat memories, you know. But uh, we showed those to Bill, and he, he talked us through some improvements he might want to make. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we became good friends, so we started talking more and more over the phone. He has a lot of relationships with guys within Special Forces. He was already doing the Yarborough knife. Right. Um, so he knew, he knew General Yarborough. He knew a lot of the guys at Fort Bragg, the commander of Special Warfare Center. So we kind of made fast friends, but we knew he'd never do anything with us. He's famous um, knife maker. We're two guys in a mule barn, uh, but we were constantly talking to him, asking him for advice. And finally, he one day he said, "Well, you guys want me to design a knife for you?" I thought you'd never ask, off. Bill. <laughs> yeah, I said, "Don't ask again." Yes, it's a done deal. I'll sign whatever you want, right? And he goes, "I trust you guys. We're not doing any paperwork. I'll just send you a design." So it was a Spartan Harzy Model One. And Bill, so we created the knives and the handles, and Bill Harsey hand ground every single one of those. Oh, whoa. In fact, you know, you, you notice this when I turn the camera on. I got one here. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I was still working, I was working for another government agency in Iraq and Afghanistan, going back and forth. Uh, so, Mark and I, we weren't paying ourselves, and Mark was staying at home here working while I was traveling back and forth. So, uh, while I was in Iraq, um, it, my, it was my birthday. I was coming home a few days later. So I came home and on my computer, I found a, a knife case sitting there. I'm like, what, what What? the hell is this doing on my computer? He goes, well, why don't you open it, dumbass? Mark did. So I did. And uh, it was a custom hand ground uh, model one made out of Torres Damascus by Bill Arzi for my birthday. That uh, is... Yeah. So uh, I made a mistake of taking this to a knife show once. That'll never happen again. 
people bug me all day long trying to get me drunk and so they could buy it. So, <laughs> but um, this, but that's the first project we ever did with Bill Harsey were the model ones. I think we made about 200 of them. And he said, Hey guys, I'm not getting any younger. I can't stand in front of this grinder and grind these knives over and over and over again. So the deal we cut with him was, Hey, when you're tired of doing it, you tell us and that'll be the end of the run. And that's what happened. So uh, we did something similar called uh, the model two, uh, which eventually was replaced by the defense that we did for uh, a special operations unit up in Canada. So, so that, that knife let us cement our friendship. Um, a bill probably calls me twice a day. Um, a phone rings and my wife's like, it's probably Bill. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he was a good friend first. And I think that's what that's part of the reason he wanted to do the knife. Um, he's it's, you know, hindsight is probably charity to us at the time. But uh, we won an award for it at Blade Show. Um, that's that you're talking about the Model 1? The Model 1. Yeah. And uh, we couldn't believe it. We were going to submit anything because we were small guys. And uh, Bill said, hey, go ahead and submit it for collaboration. You never know. We might win. And we did. So uh, and that, that that really helped us a lot. So. Yeah, so what you. else what else has he done for you? I know he uh well the defensa uh, what else? So we've done the Spartan Har Harzi uh, model 1, the model 2, the defensa uh the SHF and uh and then uh there's a Spartan Harzi dagger uh, which is uh one we we just did this. Mm. And I tell you what there, there was a you know the camera's reversed so I, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there it is. So uh you know, I talked to Bill. I, I always love the Gerber Mark II. I mean, I just, there's something simple, clean, and, and, and visceral about it. It's like a beautiful woman. I've always liked it. Yep. So I called Bill. I said, hey, Bill, if we can do something similar to the Gerber Mark II in the, in the Sykes Fairbairn with modern materials, heat treat and coating, make it a modern knife, um, I would really love to do that. So we work on this knife, even though it's about as simple as a dagger can get. We've had to work on this thing for about eight months, um, you know, making sure it's got a hollow grind, uh, making sure it's full tang through yeah. the back, uh, development of the handles. You know, I think I told you earlier, a lot of knives are uh, in knife fights these days or guys in combat, they end up in these pounding matches where they pound at each other with a knife till someone stops. Uh -huh. um, and, and, but most of the guys I talked to said, you know, it's, it's a push. Yeah, the dagger's meant to go in, but getting it out is sometimes not as easy when you're going back and forth which is why uh, Bill rounded rounded the back of that handle like that. It allows you to pull it out. So, Oh, oh, oh I see. It's like, a, it's like a 360 bird's beak, basically. Right, right. But it's got a nice hollow grind in it. You know, uh, I had a guy call me the other day. He said, my dagger's not sharp enough. I said, well, does it cut paper? He goes, yeah, but it's not shaving. I was like, well, send it back. We'll make it razor sharp. <laughs> but, you know, I've held daggers from World War II. They weren't even sharpened. Yeah, you know, yeah. Every knife's a trade-off. So the thing that allows it to penetrate point well makes it really hard to sharpen, which is why we hollow ground this this knife. It allows us to get a thinner edge, yet we still get thick stock material. So uh, a lot of engineering goes, you know, a lot goes into these things. And a lot of that stuff is comes from trial and error with Bill Harsey as well. You know, he used to grind daggers for Al Mar and Colonel Applegate and those kind of things. And uh, I guess in, in, in some ways we're the beneficiary of that. So... Uh, a little bit of history goes in these things. They're, they're really special to us. My uh, my brother for my birthday got me a um, a Sheffield made uh, Fairbairn Sykes oh, wow. World War II. Um, uh, it it had the original sheet too, which is falling apart, you know, naturally, but uh, beautiful. And it's hollow ground. You know, I've seen a lot of fake Fairbairn Sykes over yeah. the years, and I've owned quite a quite a few of them. But uh, it uh, one of the one of the hallmarks of this. Uh, that uh, is, is that it's hollow ground and that the blade actually bends a little bit. I think, yeah. I, I don't know if it's, if that's from use or if it's because it's so thin, it's very sharp. On, well, on you know, back in the day um, when they developed those daggers, and there's a lot of daggers out there, but a lot of them came out of China. The Chinese folks carried them and used them. Mm -hmm. But uh, when, you, when you look at uh, history and you go back to England, uh, you know, it was a uh, foils, swords, and a lot of times they would chop those down or break them and they'd keep chopping them down. So you, you tend to see that very, very thin handle made by Sheffield, a very thin blade, something that's flexible. Hmm. You know, it's kind of based on what, the, you know, the fighting arts of the past. Um, I think today we make things a little more rugged, hardcore, symmetrical. Right, right. I, I am, I am, uh, the, the fact that you made uh, the Spartan Harzi uh, um, dagger hollow ground to me is, uh, 
I mean, that's that's worth the the cost of admission because a, lo- a lot of daggers are very, very stout and very few of them that I come across are hollow ground. And to me, that's something that's something I theoretically want because I want it to be a slicer as well as a penetrator. Sure. sure. So we, do, we put a little bit of thought into them. <laughs> so uh, you have another dagger with another favorite designer of mine, Les George. Love oh, his yeah. work. And, and that that man is a dagger, you know, he, he his knowledge on daggers and 20th century fighting knives is deep. No, it, it is. He's very knowledgeable. You know, he, he's a funny guy. Uh, half the time, I don't know if he's if he's, you know, messing with me or not, because he loves to joke around. But where he, when he doesn't joke around is when it comes to um, to knives. He takes it very seriously. And man, he, right. He's got a depth of knowledge that's incredible especially when it comes to fighting daggers and, and fighting knives in World War II. Um, he's a pretty smart guy. As a matter of fact, we're working on a bronze line folder project uh, with him now, both him and Bill. Well, I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we didn't catch <laughs> Don't that. call us. Don't call me asking for these knives because they're months and months out. So I'm going to show you what the future holds for next year. Right. Uh, poor Kim at customer service. She's going to kill me tomorrow. <laughs> so uh, this is a folder we're working on with Les George. Oh, so nice. this will be a bronze line folder made overseas, uh, but with his direction, his design. Um, can you put that a little closer there. up? Put that a little closer up to the camera so we can For sure. Oh, look at that. So uh, it's a uh, Carpenter XHP steel. Hmm. Um, we've so it's a good quality steel. Yeah. Um, he's going to come in 120 bucks somewhere in there. Street price might be a little less. Wow. Uh, Terry pocket clip. It's a thick liner. So that's coming next year. These are like five months out. Right? Okay. And then of so, course, I'm gonna I'm just gonna show you everything now that I'm in trouble. Please, but wait, wait, before you go to the next one, let me just comment on that on that George folder. It has a lot of the uh less George uh design language that we all know and love, but it's also got uh, a very Spartan feel and look to it, uh, uh, uh especially in the handle. Uh I'm very excited about that. That looks really cool. Um, we're excited about it as well. It's going to be a good sturdy knife. And, uh, like I said, this is a prototype. We've been back and forth in prototypes, fixing this and fixing that. And we finally have to work on them. Not, not to ask you to reveal anything, but have you, um, have you already decided on the manufacturer uh, who's going to be making these? Yes. Uh, the, the brown stuff. Okay. And, and will that be something eventually that you talk about, or is that just not important? Uh, I, I don't know that we'll talk about it. I can tell you it's in Taiwan. Okay. Um, oh, good. And uh, somebody who's been in the industry for 30 years. So most most people who've been a blade show for a decade or so probably know who that is. Okay. But, um, so we're working on that. And then, um, of course, and that's called the Aster, by the way, the one we're working on with Les George. Okay. And then we got Talos, which is going to be a small Harzi. If you all remember the Gerber Air mm. Ranger. Yes, I do. It's about that size, but it's lighter, believe it or not. It's a G10. We're going to do both black and green G10. Oh, cool. Um, liner lock. And these are incredibly lightweight. Um, I've already got some prototypes off the bill, and he's about as happy as he can be. He's, he's excited. I mean, he may be more excited than we are. What's the so, blade um, length on these? Uh, three and a quarter. Three and a quarter. Okay. So it's pretty darn close to the one we're making here in our shop. Of course, this Look at bottom that. is all titanium. This will be stainless steel. Uh, XHP bl- blade, though. So uh, I love XHP these. steel. Yeah, so it's a good steel with liner lock, as opposed to a frame lock. So okay. now this is this is several months out. So we're not putting names on lists or anything like that. Uh, we'll let you know when they're ready, everyone, and you can find them on the website. <laughs> <laughs> So you got you got something from Les George. You got another thing from from Bill Harzi. Uh, another collaboration knife that just came out, I think, twenty nineteen, was the one with Two Lamb, who is a yes. cool cat, man. Uh, I I first he first came on my radar uh, when he was a judge on um, Knife or Death, and yeah. and then you know he was always talking about the angles, and I'm like, okay, this guy obviously uh, has some serious like. Uh, Filipino martial arts training, and I figured Filipino just because his angling. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, that's the Ronin Shinto. Funny story, we're also working on a folder with him. It's going to come out a little later next year. Uh-huh. <coughs> the funny thing about Two Lamb is uh, Mark and I, we were in a, a 
special missions unit over in Asia, counterterrorism unit, and we were in a sniper section. And uh, we get this young E5 that shows up, kid named Two Lamb. He looked like he weighed about 95 pounds, skinny as a rail, and never talked, right? And uh, he's one of the assaulters. So we had a few assault teams, and then we had two sniper teams upstairs, and we did combined missions together. He showed up as an assaulter. He was a great shooter to start, but you could never get the guy to talk. Well, his father was a special forces soldier in Vietnam and told him, when you get over there to Okinawa, you get on a team, you keep your mouth shut and do what you're told. And he took him literally. <laughs> so, <laughs> so to me, you know, so we worked with two lamb, you know, used to shoot together and those kind of things. And uh, he was just this little skinny, silent guy. Now he's this muscle bound, loud martial artist who's on call of duty, haloing from, from, you know, uh, it's, it's just, you know, I knew him as a young kid and to see what he's turned into yeah. now um, is awesome. And if you don't know who two lamb is or own tactics, you got to check them out on, on Instagram or, or YouTube. Um, that is who he really is. That's not a show. It's not a persona created for him by a, some marketing guy. That's really who he is. And he's just a great guy. Yeah. He seems like a really nice and terrifying guy. Uh, you see him in the, uh, you see him in those, uh, sort of room clearing videos that he has on YouTube and different, different, uh, uh, run and gun kind of, kind of, yeah, man, he, he seems like he's got it all. all. Well, I'm happy about the fact I taught him everything I know. So. Oh yeah. I'm, yeah sure. Right. <laughs> I'm sure he's very happy about that. <laughs> So uh, when you when you went to Tulam, did did you come to him and ask him to make a knife design? Did he come to you? How'd that work? I'm I'm trying to remember because I've known him for decades. Um, you know, I think when he was starting his business, we were talking more about business, and uh, you know, he was telling me about all the traveling he's doing and that kind of thing, and he was trying to you know explain to him he's gonna have to pace himself and stuff like that, and because uh, we talk more as friends really than than we do about business. But uh, either he or I mentioned it, and whoever was right away, we're like, oh, yeah, done deal. It's, yeah, that's e it's an easy one. You know, he trusts us. We trust him. He knew we had okay reputation. We knew we could trust him. So, uh, you know, we worked, on a, we worked on a fixed blade project together. And I got to tell you, that, that, that Shinto, that's been our top seller for the last six months or so. Oh, really? Yeah, it, it's doing fantastic. Um, and then his character in Call of Duty has it on his belt. Now, I don't know right. if that helped or not. But God Almighty, sales have been fantastic. Yeah, I'm sure it didn't hurt. I'm sure it didn't hurt. A lot of, you know, lot of, a lot of eyes on that game. You know, I was, I was joking uh, with, with Mark the other day. I said, man, I, I hope Two Lamb's business and what he's doing fails because I would love to have him run customer service for us. <laughs> yeah. Nobody would ever call to complain about anything. <laughs> yeah, right. I want, I want a different color. No. Okay, I'm sorry. You know? Uh, 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 all right. <laughs> Uh, so interesting thing about the the design of that is the recurve. To me, um, yeah, I, okay. That that knife has a has a lot going for it, and and a lot of people uh, look at the recurve. They're intimidated by it uh, for the sharpening aspect, yeah. which I never quite got because they're so it, easy to sharpen. It's yeah. the easiest knife for me to sharpen on the grinder. Sharp them yeah. all day long. Just just follow the curve, people. Just follow the curve. Yeah, it's really not difficult. Don't don't let a curved blade scare you from from buying it. They're easy as hell to sharpen. Okay, so as you move forward, you're you're gonna have you you're gonna have the gold, uh, the silver, and the bronze lines. That's right. That's right. Um, are, do you plan on adding models to each one of those lines each year? Kind of like building them out of the, the full product line. Oh yeah, absolutely. We've got. Uh, so for the silver line, well, you've just seen some of the stuff for the gold line. Mm -hmm. Bill's new knife. I'm work. I'm designing a new fixed blade, um, based on what I've learned from Bill over the last decade. I, I showed it to Bill. He's happy with it, so he gave me an A plus on it. So that's coming out. Oh, right we're doing on. another fixed blade. We're doing the the three two five with Bill as part of the gold line. Now Bill's designed three knives for our silver line as well. So mm. the contoured handle that you're used to seeing on the Defensa, yes, uh, we'll have that on a, on a, a less expensive silver line knife. There'll be a combat knife, uh, a kukri designed by Bill, Ooh. and a Nesmuk. Oh, nice. Yeah, so some something a little different for us. But we'll have a handle very similar to this. It'll be injection molded, but it'll well, be right in line with some of the knives you've seen come out of K-Bar. So okay. And K-Bar will make those knives for us out of 1095. So we've got three Harzi designs coming out uh, next year for the silver line. And for the okay. bronze line, um, you've got the folders I just showed you. And uh, we recently did a small Enyo, um, a bronze line Enyo. 
Wow. And the Enyo is a neck knife, right? A it's a small blade. neck knife we make. Yeah, we, we've been making it for about 10 years. Um, we've never raised the price on it. And quite honestly, the Enyo, um, we, we don't make a whole lot of money on them making them here in the U.S., but we knew we couldn't turn them off. So we yeah. thought it was a perfect candidate to go to Taiwan with. So we're going to do that. Um, and it, it comes with the sheath. It's got some uh, secondary retention in them and, and that kind of thing. So, uh, uh, yeah. So you mentioned so, uh, uh, a Nesmuk. Uh, that that uh, to me that that makes a lot of sense. Everything you have uh, in your product line is, uh, um, it, from my eye, you know, it's very tactically oriented. Uh, even this, which is a, a tactical folder, I mean, but this is a an exquisite EDC like all arounder. Um, well, what I'm trying to get at is it's really smart to come out with a Nesmuk, which is a traditional outdoors and, and hunting knife. I think it's Canadian. Um, but a lot of people who are your um, demographic are also huntsmen or you know, sure. outdoorsmen. And it uh, makes sense to branch in that direction. No, I, I think so. You got to look at what people buy knives for and, and what they're going to use them for. I mean, and then there's what people want. You know, there's what we need. There's implied tasks that we need to take care of when we're using a knife. And then of course there's what people want. I mean, let's be honest. The West was one with trade knives. They were carbon knives that were easy to sharpen with a wooden handle. So in most instances, that's what you need, but I want this. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, you can't be everything to everybody. But man, if you give it some thought, you can look at common tasks and either design a new knife to cover that common task or make one that covers a broad spectrum of, of tasks. Uh, so you can hit that 80 percentile of people um, that need a sharp instrument to, to do something. So, uh, yeah, that's, you know, you look at these two knives, for example, you take a Harzi dagger and you take a, a Shinto, two yes, completely please. different knives. You know, I, I learned that as a young weapon sergeant, special forces. I had an older guy tell me one time, he goes, hey, listen, Curtis, every weapon's a trade-off, all right? So when you go on a mission, you need to look at the implied task for that mission. Then you bring the weapon that's going to help you accomplish that mission. He goes, you know, the thing that makes a great sniper rifle is the fact that it's long, heavy, and low to the ground. But, man, it sucks if you're jumping fences with it. Mm -hmm. He goes, the great thing about assault rifle is you get a lot of rounds down range. You can aim individually and shoot. But if you need to climb a building or get over a fence or crawl under a vehicle, it's got a pistol grip, allows you to hang on to it. But it makes a shitty sniper rifle. So it's not that either one of those weapons is bad. It's just there's implied tasks where one works better for the other. You know, if there's one knife that did everything, that's the only knife we'd make, and we just make it to perfection. Right. But, right. you know, pe people hear our tagline, knives with intent. Yeah, it might sound a, sound a little ominous. But your intent might be to teach your grandson how to kill and gut a rabbit. You know, your intent might be to go to work and open 50 damn boxes at work and your, your boss thinks supply you a box cutter. Yeah. So when we say knives with intent, you know, your, your intent could be anything. So we, we try to make a, a wide range of products uh, that will cover different implied tasks for people doing different things, whether it's hunting, working, you know, recreation. You're trying to cover them all. So. Well, so you've been at it, uh, you and Mark have been at it for 12 years. Uh, what what kind of lessons have you distilled out of uh, being in the knife world? And what kind of recommendations, what would you give as advice to people who are uh, coming up and want, you know, want aspire to have a company like yours or aspire to be a knife maker or just well, wants to do something on the weekends? Well, you know, those are three distinct things, you know, running a business, uh, becoming a custom life maker or having something to do on the weekend. Yeah, you're, yeah right. You know, okay. uh, if, if you're going to do something, do it right. And if you treat whatever you're doing like a mission, there's certain things you got to know when you start a mission. One, what's, what's the intent? What, what's, what's your end state? Two, you always need to understand your operational environment, whether you're conducting a raid, you're rescuing a hostage, or you're starting a new hobby. If you understand your operational environment and you understand the things going on around you, um, for example, if, if you're studying a business, who's your competition? Who are your possible allies? Um, what can you do reasonably with what you've been given, the money, the supplies, the equipment? If you identify those things before you ever make the knife, you can do yourself some favors. You know what? We get guys come by here all the time. Um, you know, Chris Reeve told us 
you know, if somebody comes to you for help and you don't help them, they're going to find out what they need to know. And you'll always be that jerk that didn't help them. And they'll never <laughs> forget it. And he's right. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's starting a company or they, or they, they want to grow their company or they just have questions about life making, our doors are open to them. We have people come sit on our couch here in our office all the time and we'll run them through our books, whatever it takes to help them be successful because somebody did it for us. So sometimes we have guys come in and like, listen, I've been, I've been, I'm a custom knife maker. I know my knives are better than yours because I make them one at a time and they're good. And I want to continue to do more and grow this business. And I say, well, what does it cost you? To, what does it cost you to make this knife right here? And they're like, it cost me 108 bucks. I said 108 bucks. So that's just your cost. Well, what are you selling it for? 210. It's like, okay, well, what's your GNA? Oh, I don't know. What's your overhead? I'm not sure what's your marketing cost. I, you know, I, I do some shows and I said, what's your time worth? The shop rate in North Carolina is 60 bucks an hour. You're not going to get anybody to machine or make anything for less than 60 bucks an hour. Uh, if it means production. My point is you, you, you take that knife and they think it costs 108 bucks to make it. So they're doubling their money at say 216 and they're losing money on every knife. Yeah. Yeah. And it just, and they're smart guys. They're smart and talented. But sometimes, you know, you, you got to sometimes you need to go out there and ask people, you got to be honest with yourself. What do I know? What am I good at? And what am I not good at? And what don't I know? Find someone who knows how to do that and ask them for help. And they'll almost always help you. Uh, the knife community is a great community. There's very few jerks in the knife community. That's, so, that's uh, you know, that's been my experience so far. Let me ask you this. How has your partnership with Mark how has your different temperaments, uh, how do they complement one another and how have they led to your success? Oh, yeah. yeah. We've identified that years ago. So, Mark, so I'm an omnidirectional thinker, I think, in all directions. You know, oh, look, a squirrel, that kind of guy. Um, I love the draw. I love the art side of it. Um, I'm talking to you on an apple. He has a <laughs> his desk. I've got, I don't know if you can see it, I've got. You know, colored magic markers all over the damn place. Mark has three ink pens. <laughs> I can't find shit on my computer because it's just all over the desktop. His are in individual files. So he's a linear thinker. He loves to, the, you know, the paperwork, ordering materials, reducing cost. I design and I like to build them. I sharpen them. So we just kind of fit together just like this. Everything I like to do, he hates and vice versa. Mm. He doesn't have a Facebook account and he's never getting one. <laughs> he just thinks it's silly. He's like, it's, it's like for children and old women. It's like, no, Mark, this is for marketing, man. Um, he, uh, <laughs> but he's a great guy. I love him. He's a brother. He's my brother. Um, we just have completely different personalities, but it matches together perfectly. Yeah, you're yin and yang, um, order of chaos. To... Yeah, and you, you'd think like Jake and AJ and Kim and them, the guys that work at the back, they'd be like, hey, dad, mom said this is okay. Can we do this? They don't do that either. They, they know we're a united front. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's we're honest with ourselves about what we're good at and what we're not. We identify that early on. And, you know, we never said, Curtis, you're going to design the knives and take care of marketing, and I'm going to order the material. We never decided to do that. We just started working and that's how it worked out. It worked, and I think we're lucky in a lot of respects. You, know, you see a lot of people team up, um, and they both want to be a CEO and tell somebody what to do. And you can't run a business that way. Yeah. So I think in a lot of ways we're just very fortunate. You know? Well, uh, so before we wrap, tell listeners where and viewers where they or when they can expect the new models to start coming out. Uh, and and we want to reiterate this for two reasons. One, so you can remind people what's coming out and then also right. remind them that it's not coming out for a while. That's right. So the new, um, the Harzi 325, in a few days, let's say next week, Monday, somewhere around there. So we've been putting them together all week, but you know, you got to put them together. You got to carry them. You got to use them a bit, you know, yeah. look for any shortfalls. And uh, we're pretty happy with it. A few tiny little things you, you always got to work on, but that will be in about a week. Um, our bronze line folders, they're still about five, six months out, but, um, we've got one come from two lamb too. It's kind of a folding crombit. And then, uh, the silver line will have three more Harjis coming out next year. So, well, 
Thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. No, I appreciate it. It's fun. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's a real pleasure to finally meet you and talk to you. Uh, Thank you. You, you have a, you have a, a storied you have a storied past and 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 it seems like mark does too and i always think it's cool when when people come from a different world and they start making knives and obviously the military world is a, a direct feed um so anyway it's been a real pleasure sir thanks yeah, for coming on the show. i had a good time i appreciate it appreciate you having me on um yeah i listened to the, the one you did with bill harzi it was pretty good oh yeah he is a character yeah <laughs> he's just a dumb logger right yeah yeah right sure <laughs> He's With like a Columbo. fine arts degree. Yeah. yeah. yeah all, right. all righty, sir. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Bob. Take care. You guys be safe. All right. You too. Bye-bye. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you've got questions or comments, call the 24-7 Knife Junkie listener line at 724-466-4487. All righty. I remembered to turn my mic on this time, Bob. Oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Back on the Knife Junkie podcast, episode number 152. And uh, I got to admit, Bob, I was doing the show prep like you were uh, before the interview, and I instantly had a uh, connection to uh, to Curtis and to Spartan Knives because I was born and raised in Fayetteville, North Carolina, home of uh, uh, Fort Bragg and Pope Air Force Base. So, uh, yeah, definitely. I didn't realize uh, you were that close to them. Absolutely right there, right in the heart of Fayetteville. And they started in Aberdeen, now in Spring Lake, uh, I believe. And uh, yeah, so that's that's my old stomping ground. But uh, your uh, your takeaway, your thoughts from uh, this great interview. Well, firstly, you need a Spartan knife because it's made in your, <laughs> in your old in your backyard. You definitely need one. But um, no, I just uh, it was great to talk to Curtis. And, and for me, it's always a thrill to talk to the people behind the knives but it's so cool to to hear about Spartan who's a very small company as he mentioned uh, as many of our friends of this show have mentioned uh, they've called up the company and said I, I can't find uh, say the Spartan Harzi and if they have the parts there they'll put it together for you I mean they're they're nimble and uh, they're the kind of company that really cares and they know what they're doing because they've done it you know they're with their operational backgrounds um, you know, they're really well qualified to put out the kind of knives they're making. Plus now they're expanding in such a way that so many more, so many other people can uh, enjoy their, their knives. It's pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And definitely uh, thanks to, uh, to Curtis for, uh, for his service and uh, for protecting uh, my family and yours. We certainly do appreciate that as well. Yeah, so Absolutely. All the other yeah. All right. I uh, want to remind you to uh, join us again this coming uh, midweek Wednesday for the uh, supplemental episode of the Knife Junkie podcast. And then be sure to join Bob on Thursday night at 10 p.m. on the YouTube channel and the Facebook page for Thursday Night Knives. So again, thanks to uh, Curtis for being on the podcast. For Mr. Knife Junkie himself, Bob DeMarco, I'm the knife newbie over here, Jim Person, saying thanks so much for joining us on this episode of the Knife Junkie podcast. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.